In this video, we're going to talk about body fluid and its distribution between extracellular versus intracellular compartments. The total amount of fluid or water in a human body is called total body water. The actual total volume body water, of course, depends on a variety of factors, including the size, sex, and body mass index. In a young adult, total body water is approximately 60%. But importantly, the total body water for women is 50% because for 10% of fluid which men have, women have adipose tissue instead, I mean in a mammary glands. And total body water in a rapidly growing infants is approximately 75% of body weight. The total body fluid is distributed between two compartments mainly, the extracellular compartment and the intracellular compartment. The extracellular fluid is divided into the interstitial fluid and the blood plasma. In a 70 kg person, the total body water equals 42 liters, approximately two-thirds or 28 liters of total body water is intracellular fluid. One-third or 14 liters of total body water is an extracellular fluid. Interstitial fluid is about three-fourths of the extracellular fluid, which equals to 10.5 liters. Plasma volume is approximately one-fourth of the extracellular fluid volume, which is equal to 3.5 liters. And this raises a very interesting question. The intracellular compartment contains more fluid when compared with extracellular compartment a 28 to 14 ratio or half. So why is the fluid not equally distributed within these two compartments? And this brings us to the effects of osmosis. What is osmosis? Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. You know that the water always diffuses from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower water concentration. Now I take a container and separate it into two compartments. The barrier that is separating this container is semi-permeable. In our case, suppose it is permeable to water, but not to the other substance. I take a bottle and fill side B with 2 liters of water. Water, of course, will not stay inside B and moves to compartment A as well because the membrane is permeable to water and water equilibrates between two spaces. So now we have 1 liter inside A and the same amount inside B. I take and add a small amount of sodium chloride to side A. Now side A has high concentration of sodium chloride and side B has no sodium chloride at all. Why? Because the membrane is not permeable for sodium chloride. Thus it doesn't allow sodium chloride to move from side A to side B. It is important to note that the concentration of the dissolved substance, in our case sodium chloride, determines the concentration of water. Increased concentration of dissolved substances decreases the concentration of water. So concentration of dissolved substances inside A is more than inside B that doesn't have sodium chloride at all. Thus, the concentration of water is less in this compartment when compared to side B. Therefore, water diffuses from side B to side A from the higher concentration of water to the lower concentration and we see that the height of column A rises and that of B falls. Water would diffuse to A side to equalize its concentration between the two compartments and diffusion continues until the water concentration is equal in both sides and there would be no water concentration gradient. This is exactly what we call osmosis. Again, osmosis is a diffusion of water across a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. 
let's suppose that the membrane was permeable to the sodium chloride. When I add 10 grams of sodium chloride to side A, because the membrane is either permeable to water and sodium chloride, half of the solutes move to side B and would equalize its concentration between the two compartments, so there would be no water concentration gradient and no net diffusion of water. But in our case, the membrane is not permeable to sodium chloride. Therefore, it is very important to note that if a solute doesn't easily cross a membrane, it creates an osmotic force for that compartment. So sodium chloride that cannot penetrate the membrane and leak to side B will create an osmotic force for water. In other words, sodium chloride creates an effective osmol for compartment A. Returning to our total body water, the membrane that is separating the intracellular compartment from extracellular compartment is a cell membrane and is also a selectively permeable membrane, like the membrane that I put in our container. Here also the distribution of fluid between the intracellular and extracellular compartments is determined by osmotic forces. Osmotic effect in an A side of our container was created by adding sodium chloride that didn't penetrate the membrane. Similar to this, in an extracellular fluid, the main dissolved substance that cannot penetrate the cell membrane is sodium ions. This sodium ions create an osmotic effect across the cell membrane. It is important to note that sodium is a charged species which maintains electrical neutrality. Therefore, another ion, a negative ion, always has to stay with sodium in order to neutralize its ionic and reactive nature. It may be chloride, bicarbonate, and monohydrogen phosphate. Because the negative ion stays with sodium, it also creates an osmotic effect. Therefore, the osmotic effect of the extracellular fluid is basically two times the sodium concentration. This is one of the reasons why sodium is the most abundant osmol of the extracellular space. If the sodium concentration in an extracellular fluid increases in a case of hypernutremia, it causes decreasing the water concentration in an extracellular compartment. As a consequence, the water will move from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment from a region of higher water concentration to a region of lower water concentration. Therefore, the intracellular fluid volume decreases while extracellular volume increases. On the other hand, if the sodium concentration in an extracellular fluid decreases in a case of hyponatremia, the water concentration in an extracellular compartment goes up and the water diffuses from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment down its concentration gradient. As a consequence, the intracellular fluid volume increases while the extracellular volume decreases. As you already know, every quantity is measurable. For example, we measure blood pressure as a millimeters of mercury, and we have meter, we have liter, etc. The concentration of osmotically active particles of a solution is referred as osmolarity of solution. Osmolarity is expressed more commonly as milliosmoles per liter. This brings us to a formula for calculating osmolarity of the extracellular fluid that appears in the USMLE books. The bottom line is, we only count the dissolved substances that cannot penetrate the membrane and thus create an osmotic force. As we already said, the most of osmotic effect of the extracellular fluid is created by two times sodium concentration. 
In addition, glucose also creates some osmotic effect because it penetrates the membrane slowly. Urea easily penetrates most membranes, but not all do like the blood-brain barrier and sections of the nephron, for example. Some include urea in extracellular fluid effective osmolarity, others ignore it. So osmolarity in extracellular fluid equals two times sodium concentration plus glucose in milligram percent divided by 18 plus urea divided by 2.8. Let's calculate it. Two times sodium concentration, which is equal to 137 milliequivalent plus glucose, which is 60 milligram percent divided by 18 plus 8 milligram percent of urea divided by 2.8. Please note the 18 and 2.8 are converting glucose and urea into their respective osmolarities. So we get 280 milliosmoles per liter, which is referred as a normal osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. 280 up to 290 is referred as a normal clinical value. However, USMLE rounds this off to 300 milliosmoles per liter. In the normal conditions, the most osmolarity of the extracellular fluid is created by sodium concentration. However, you have to not ignore glucose because in hyperglycemia it increases osmolarity.